My name is Isidore or short Izzy Judah. I'm also called Zadie. <laughs> I was born in Vienna in 1921, which you figure out the age. <laughs> I started school at the age of six. I completed the required eight years of schooling in Austria and part of Europe. You go to public school for eight years. You have four years of grammar school and you have four years of high school. After that, you can either go to a private school and in two years you're ready to go to university. I also completed my Jewish education. Religion in Europe is part of your curriculum. If you don't pass religion, you don't go up to the next grade. So it's taken very seriously. At 13, I had my bar mitzvah in Vienna. I still had my first film bag, which an aunt made for me. It was handmade. And I also have my siddur, which was given to me from the synagogue. This siddur is in Hebrew and German. I think the young lady has a picture of my bar mitzvah there. I'll show you what I look like. No, that's it. That's what I look like. And I believe you had the picture when I was three years old. The one before that. That's me when I was three years old. Thank you. The time I lived in Austria was a Christian Social Democratic government. We had anti-Semitism. Everybody knows what anti-Semitism is. But it was mostly in larger cities. Vienna was no exception. We as Jews lived a perfectly normal life. We could do whatever we wanted. And in 1933 to 34, the name of Adolf Hitler became known. In 1935, after completing my required schooling, I had to decide about my future education. My dream was always to become a doctor to help other people. But there was a little problem. The first problem was I was Jewish. You couldn't get into schools as a Jew. And the second problem was money. Money was very hard to get. In 1938, March 1938, Hitler marched into Vienna. And things started to get very hairy, not good at all. Special orders started to come out. Jews were only able to go to Jewish hospitals, Jewish doctors, and to Jewish stores to shop. As things started to get worse, People, Jewish people tried to get out of Vienna, and the only way you could get out of the country was by receiving a visa to another country. The United States had, German, had a German quota, and when Hitler marched into Poland in 1939, in Austria in 1938, all the Jews went onto the German quota. So you can imagine the size of that quota. My father had relatives in a small town called Vineland, New Jersey.
The uncle had three children, and each one of them gave a visa to one of our families. The first visa came and was given to my father's older sister. <coughs> now we waited for another visa, and he knew, I knew this was going to take too long. In July of 1938, I had a little argument, a physical argument, with a school friend who was not Jewish, and he threatened that he's going to come for me the next day. And when I met my father again, after two and a half years in the United States, he told me that he came the next day with two German officers looking for me. So I knew I had to leave the country. One morning I decided to get out and I got on a train to go to the western part of Austria and from there I walked across the Alps into Switzerland. I lived in Switzerland from 1938 till May 13, 1940, when I came to the United States. I arrived 19, uh, May the 13th, 1940. My parents were there already. They came to the United States in 1939. And an uncle picked me up. And we went to Vineland. I started to work there and started to learn a little bit of English because I only spoke three words, yes, no, and thank you. That was a big vocabulary then. <laughs> the war broke out in December 7, 1941. You all remember that? The Japanese attacked on Hawaii. <laughs> and I was drafted in February in uh, February 1942. I mean October that <coughs> October 1942. Went into the service. Went overseas in 1943 to the South Pacific. I fought in three battles: Guadalcanal, Bougainville, the Philippines. I was injured in the Philippines. It took four surgeries to heal my leg. I was injured in my right leg, to heal my leg. I was discharged November 1945. In 46, I married and, met and married a young lady by the name of Esther Weinstein. And we had two children. Jerry and Stan, they're right here. <laughs> Eric, who's right here, and his brother, Michael, who is in, outside of Philadelphia. We had a wonderful marriage for 52, close to 53 years. That's me in the service. We had a wonderful life, until unfortunately she passed away in 2000. At that time, I had retired, or I retired in 86. And I hated the cold weather. To this day, I hate the cold weather. <laughs> and my children says, Dad, why don't you go to Florida? I went to Florida and met another lovely lady. I married her in 2004. Somebody else got married in 2004. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, in 2012, I saw there was something wrong. She had dementia. Things started to get worse. And in 2014, we had to separate. And she passed away in 2016. After we separated, I came to my, do my daughter. Said, my daughter and son said to me, you can't be alone and I was brought to New Haven, Connecticut 
in a live at a place called the Towers, which is an independent living, and I enjoy living there. And that's my little story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. years old when the Nazis came to Austria. In 1934, Austria has its first experience with Nazism. It was not legal in the country at that time. Dressed as an Austrian soldier, Nazis entered the chancellery in Vienna and murdered the chancellor and they appointed a puppet chancellor. And the next thing we started to hear the word Anschluss. Anybody know what Anschluss means? It means to become part of it. They were talking about Austria to become part of Germany. And if you read history, Germany wanted the whole world. He wanted the whole world to become Germany. In 1938, there were 1,935,000 people in Vienna. There were 175,000 Jews. In 1945, there were 8,000 Jews left. The rest either escaped and the majority was murdered. In 19, on March 12, 1938, that was after Hitler marched into Austria, I was on the way home from my business school. I was going to my subway station. However, I was not able to cross the main street in the city. Adolf Hitler was entering the city. There were lines of people cheering the man whose goal was to take over Austria and the rest of the world. As I got home, my mother was standing in the doorway crying, saying that Hitler is in Vienna. I said, I know, I saw him. I watched from him as far as that green door is. He was driving into Vienna. When I returned to school a week later, I asked my teacher why these restrictions were happening. I was told it would be better not to ask. You know where they're going to send you if you keep asking. The following week, all Jewish students were told not to return to school, and unfortunately, that was the end of my business school education. 
One day, while I was waiting in my, while I was on my way to visit my aunt, I heard screaming and yelling around the corner. SA troopers, if you recall, there were two kinds of people, two kinds of, I call them murderers in, the, in Germany, SA and SS. SS was the elite, supposed to be the elite. They were running all, up to all Jewish men and boys and herding them into the school building across from my aunt's house. Lucky for me, I knew some back ways and quickly returned home. My father was there, and as I came into the house crying, I asked why these things were happening. They were our neighbors for many years. He looked at me and he says, I don't know why. A few days later, when I did get to my aunt's house, we heard yelling, clapping, and laughing. We looked out and saw an SS officer on the fourth floor of the school holding a little child by its legs and hitting it outside against the building, the wall, against the building. After the child was bloodied, he dropped it to the ground. These were some of their entertainment. Two days later, my dad's younger sister came to our house crying that her husband had been arrested and taken away. As she was leaving, there was a knock on our door. We were all holding our breath. My dad opened the door. There was a girl who was a neighbor of my mother's brother telling us they all had been arrested. I lost three uncles and their families. At that time, Jewish boys and girls did their best to stay together and stay away from the Hitler Youth, who were always looking for a fight. One day, one of my former non-Jewish boy school friends came by and turned to one of the Jewish girls and spit a head on her and called her a Jewish pig and other insults. I asked him why he was doing that, since we all had gone to school together. I turned and punched him in the nose and blooded his face. He answered me, I'll get you, Jew boy. After that incident, I knew I couldn't stay in Vienna much longer. My friend and neighbor Otto and I had been discussing about leaving where we might go. He suggested Hungary, but I disagreed. I told him we need to be near Switzerland and Italy in order to leave Europe. When I told Otto that I was ready to go and asked him to go with me, he said he would not leave his parents. I never discussed with my own parents to leave because they would have never let me go alone. We had relatives on my father's side, as I told the other group before, and things became deteriorated, and we were asking for a visa to the United States. Unfortunately, it took a lot of time to get it. I know I couldn't wait much longer. That evening, I told my mother, which was August 1938, that I was going to the Jewish hospital the next morning to have a look at a cut on my hand. The cut was really nothing, but I had to have a reason. Before they awakened that next morning, I knew my father had hidden some money. I took some of that money, and with only the clothes on my back, I had decided to go to Switzerland and from there to Italy, and then try to get to the United States. On the way to the train, I bought a small suitcase, a shirt, and socks. At the train station, I inquired about a ticket to, the, to Bregenz, which is pretty well in the western part of Austria. That was the last time before the Swiss border. I checked my money, didn't have enough to go there, so I bought a ticket to Salzburg. I was about to, about to board the train Two SS officers were checking tickets. 
They asked me where I was going. I told them that I was going to visit my grandmother in Salzburg. I never had a grandmother in Salzburg. They looked me over and over and finally said I could board the train. As the train station was about to leave, I said to myself, I never see my parents and my family again. I looked at some of the other passengers and I realized I was not the only one leaving. As the pa train passed the city of Graz, tears came to my eyes as I thought of my aunt, my aunt, uncle, and cousin who had disappeared from their home. When the train arrived in Salzburg, I knew I had to stay on that train. I had no ticket, but I took a chance. I was lucky and able to stay in the train to Bregenz. As I got off the train, I inquired where I could cross into Switzerland. I was very hungry, so I bought a roll and a glass of milk. I was told there was a railroad bridge going into Switzerland and was told where it was. I also needed to know the train schedule and found out there were no trains during the night. There were very few Nazis to be seen and the people were very friendly. At nightfall, I started to cross the bridge on foot. Halfway across the bridge, I heard the word halt. I didn't stop. I continued to walk and I heard halt or I shoot. This time I stopped. Two assessmen came up and told me, come with me. At the station, they asked me where the rest of the people were. I told them I was alone. The officer who questioned me hit me and said, don't lie to me, Jew boy. Again, I said that I was alone. He hit me again and said, you're staying here tonight. I asked him for some water. He said that I would get nothing. In the morning, they would walk me to the train station. Children and some adults would spit on me and yell, Jew boy, you're going to die. They bought me a ticket to Salzburg and told me if would, I would have to get on a train back to Vienna. They also told me if I get caught, I know what would happen to me. As I got on the train, I looked at some other passengers and I realized that this train was never going to go to Salzburg. This train was heading to a camp. As luck would have it, the train suddenly slowed down. I'm 97, 97 years old. To this day, I don't know what made this train slow down. Somebody up there did something. For no apparent reason, I took a chance. I had nothing to lose and jumped off the train. I laid on the ground until the train left, got up, looked around, and realized where I was. I had been in this part of the country before. We used to go skiing there. I knew I had to go over the mountain, which were the Alps. After two to three hours walking, I came upon a farmer who was herding his cows. He asked where I was going, and I told him to Switzerland. He said, you're not going tonight. He took me to his farmhouse where his wife fed me and let me sleep in the barn that night. The next morning, he woke me very early, gave me breakfast, said, now we will go up to the mountain. After a while we stopped, he told me to look to the right. There I saw the SS station before the Swiss border. Soon he pointed me in the direction of the border where I could cross safely. As I came to the border, there was only a sign with no barrier. 
I crossed and started to go down the mountain. After a while, I bumped into a Swiss gendarme who asked me where I was go what I was doing here. I told him that I wanted to stay in Switzerland. He took me to the station and the officer told me I was now a political immigrant. I said I didn't know anything about politics. <laughs> and he said that was the only way I could stay in Switzerland. They looked at me and saw that I was very pretty, very badly physical condition. I was taken to a hospital in St. Gallen in Switzerland. Until this time, my parents had no idea where I was. From there, I wrote them a very carefully worded letter because letters into German territory were all censored, going in and coming out. From the hospital, I was taken to an immigration camp where I remained until I, until I received my visa to come to the United States. In order to leave Switzerland, I needed a passport. This is the beginning, this is the outside of the passport. Even though I was away from Germany, they still had, I had to get a German passport. If you move the they still had to let the world know that you're Jewish. They put a J in there. You see that red J? Mm -hmm. That means you were Jewish. And when you flip it over, that was me at 16 years old with the passport. Thank you. I received my reason to come to the United States in August of 1938. But I had to get to Italy. So I needed a transit visa. Nothing was easy. I went to the Italian council. He says, today's a holiday. We don't work today. I said, what kind of holiday is she said, the Italian holiday. So I tried to explain to him, I have to be in Genoa to meet the ship. I can't wait for another day. Well, back and forth, we finally did it. Unbeknownst to me, my parents and sister had received their visa while I was in Switzerland. They had arrived in the United States in December 1935. I had a job waiting for me in Vineland, Vineland, New Jersey, where I immediately went to work. And as I told you, I had to learn English. They told me I had to go to night school. I went to night school for two nights. <laughs> and I saw people there who've been in this country for 50 years, they still couldn't speak English. I said, I'm not gonna learn anything. I started to read newspapers, and that's how it started to learn English. I was drafted in the United States Army, as I told you before. I served in the Pacific Theater. I, I was in combat. I was a BAR man, automatic machine gunner. I was in Guadalcanal, Bougainville, the Philippines. I was wounded in the Philippines while we were taking clock, clock field back from the Japanese. After many surgeries, in months in various army hospitals. I was discharged in November 1945. I received a Purple Heart on SAR Combat Infantryman in the Presidential Citation. The rest, I told you, that's my story. Back terrible memories. When I see a Holocaust movie, it brings back terrible memories, and most of the time I, I don't fall asleep too good. Um, how do you remember everything so clearly? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. How do you remember everything so clearly? How do you remember so clearly? How do you remember everything so clearly? 
Unfortunately, these are things, and there are many more atrocities which I can't even talk about. And you never forget. And the reason I'm telling these stories, especially to young people like you, is to remember this. And don't let anybody tell you it didn't happen. Yes, yeah. Oh, um, so my great-grandfather was, my great-grandfather was also fought in World War II. Um, I don't think you, I don't think, um, you know his name, his name was Alan, Alan Greenblatt. He was saying that his great-grandfather also fought in World War II. Oh. Yes. His name was Alan Greenblatt. Alan Greenblatt. He's giving you his name. <laughs> He's telling nice. you his name. Very nice. <laughs> After the Holocaust, what scares you the most now? Got me? After the Holocaust, what scares you the most now? After the Holocaust, what, what scares you the most now? What do you find? What scares me the most now when we had the shooting in, in Pittsburgh, when they attacked the synagogue in Pittsburgh, I said, not again. And now we had the shooting in California, in the synagogue in California. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism will never die. Did you lose any hope during the Holocaust? Did I what? Lose any hope during the Holocaust? Hopes? Did you hope. lose hope? Did you, you have lose to hope? have hope. Did you lose any? No. He's saying you have to have hope. You have to have hope, honey. Yes. Did you have any songs that you would sing to make yourself feel better? How did you help yourself feel better in moments of like being afraid well, or my, scared? My, my whole thing was to get out. My, my, I helped to get out a lot. What was your attitude towards God? What? What was your attitude towards God and, and, and religion? My religion is very important to me. I believe in God. I think whatever's happening on this earth is controlled by God. Yes? Why do you think anti-Semitism is on the rise now? Why do I think it is on the rise now? I don't want to go into politics. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we have politicians in this country now who are feeding that animal. They are not doing the right thing, and whatever they say, every other thing, it feeds anti-Semitism. Um, when you jumped off the train, do you know where the train was going? Like what camp? We don't know what camp, but it was going to a camp. I saw it when I looked at the people on the train. I looked at their faces. I knew this train was going to a camp. I don't know what camp. Let me get so did you do anything that you're not proud of over your life? If I did anything I'm not proud of? Actually, no. <laughs> no. No. Do you have any friends who also survived the Holocaust or just your family? I, where I live in, uh, unfortunately they're dying. You know, when you get to 97, there's not much left there, you know. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, we had a group, when I lived in Florida, we had a Holocaust uh, organization. When I got there in, 2000, in, in 2001, that organization had something like 150 members. And I, I still have one friend left in Florida, I speak to her. And she tells me there's maybe 25 people left. They all passed away. Yes? Um, do you, um, or um, how often do you keep in touch with it, Holocaust survivors? Well, where I live, there are two, two Holocaust survivors. That's all that's left there. And we see each other every day. Yes? Um, what was the scariest thing of, from the Holocaust? 
What was the scariest thing you experienced? The scariest day in the Holocaust for me was when, the, when this, this young boy said to me, I'll get even with you, I'll see you tomorrow, I'll get you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I knew what he was saying. And, it, and as it turned out, when my father told me that he came, I knew, that, knew I did the right thing. Do you have any siblings? What? Do you have any siblings? I had a sister who lived in Philadelphia. When she came here after the Holocaust, she was uh, just about 10 years old. She passed away about, what, about six, eight years ago? Yes. Yeah, six, eight she years ago. She lived in Philadelphia. She was younger. Yeah. Yes? Um, do you know if your family survived? You know what? Who else from your family survived? From my family? I'm the only one left. No, no, the after the war. After the war. After the war. war. Who were the other members of your family that escaped? Oh, that uh, escaped was my parents, my father, mother, my sister, an, an aunt with her family. That was my father's older sister. My father's youngest sister survived. She, when they took a husband very early when Hitler marched in, she escaped to France in the underground. She lived with three boys in the underground in France until she came to the United States. And then I had one grandmother left. She came to the United States. Tell them about Martin and how they went, one to Argentina oh. and one went to the other. When I knew there was a cousin of mine who went with the children, the kinder transport, you know what that was. They had, they took out children, if they could, from Austria and from Germany, put them up, put them and brought them either to Palestine, that was Palestine that that was not Israel yet, and or they took them to England. And one of my cousins was taken to Palestine. And a um, farmer took them in, and later on he literally married the farmer's daughter. <laughs> And then I found out through him that there was another cousin who got out. He was in South America, in Buenos Aires. And then I had one cousin left who went to Israel, when it was Palestine, and his parents, unbeknownst to me, survived to go to Israel. Well, they were elderly people, they couldn't say that the heat in Israel, and work was very hard. They worked on a, on a farm, like a kibbutz. And they, after the war, they decided to go back to Vienna. And he, they begged him to stay in Israel. He says, no, I'm not, he was the only son. He couldn't, he wouldn't leave him alone. So he went back to Israel. And after 48 years, I went back to Vienna the first time. And the, the, the reason I went back primarily was they went to the grave of my aunt and my uncle and my grandfather. And that's when we met my cousin again, who was living in Vienna. It was quite a reunion. And then I had them all come to the United States on the 4th of July from South America, from Israel, and, from, and we had a big party, big splash. Yes? Um, how did you bring your C-Door and all of the things that you showed us to I, the United States? And I took it with me. I took it with me. And uh, my father kept it for me. When I went to service, he kept it for me. Mm -hmm. Yes? How old is the uh, C-Door? The C-Door? That was given to me the 1st of September, 1934. That's when I had my father's shirt. And also, do you still use it, like, nowadays? Pardon me? Do, do you, you still, still use, use it? it? Do you use it? No, I, I, I don't doubt now that this one. I use it in the mirror. I recognize it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This 
was my first American flag. It was a handkerchief. Wow. How about that, huh? Wow. I cherish that. <laughs>